Welcome to week 11 of Introduction to Horse Science. Today we will be talking about common management practices. And hitting on a lot of common management practices, we will reference different chapters of information and groups of information that we've covered previously in the semester. So there will be opportunities for review um, but there will be additional new information covered as we run through common management practices. At the end of the lecture this week, um, when we talk about the four different types of stress, when we get to that immunological stress, I am going to do a heavy, heavy, heavy review on the vaccination and deworming programs that are recommended. Um, last week, for week 10, I post a couple of guest lectures that re were recorded by Miss Holly Cruz. They did have a scientific background. They were very thorough lectures. Um, if you took the time to watch them, if you took the time to take notes, then you shouldn't have had any issues with your assignments for the week. Um, and going through your lab assignments this week, it was evident that a fair number of you aren't taking the time to watch your le lectures and understand the content. Um, so I am going to do a fair amount of review this week and in doing that fair amount of review on vaccinations and deworming, probably going to be a significant amount on your final exam on vaccinations, deworming programs, being familiar with that information in a significant amount of detail. So keep that in mind moving forward. Um, keep that in mind when you go through the last couple of slides for the, this lecture for this week. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started with the content for week 11. So in order for successful ownership and enjoyment of horses, it's going to depend on a solid knowledge of our horses and good management practice. Uh, management is going to be putting our knowledge into action. Uh, many of the management practices for horses have already been discussed in other chapters, as I previously mentioned. Um, however, largely throughout this lecture, we are going to talk about different management topics that have not been discussed elsewhere. Um, some of that includes um, dealing with stress in horses, identifying horses, and so forth. So the first topic that I want to cover with common management practices is how can we recognize stress in horses? Recognizing stress in horses and minimizing stress in horses is going to help the overall well-being of the animal. It's going to ensure our long-term success, going to ensure that that animal is going to be able to fulfill our expectations, um, fulfill what we need them to do, whether that be as a companion animal, as a show animal, um, and so forth. Um, so in recognizing stress in horses, stress is going to be a demand for adaptation. Um, some stress is necessary, but each horse has its own tolerance level. When we exceed that level of tolerance in the individual animal, then we are going to have results that we would consider to be failures. Um, knowing the signs of stress in horses and monitoring those signs of stress and reducing stress are all signs of good management practices. So what we should see in common management. Anyone who works around horses needs to be able to recognize the different signs of stress. A horse that is experiencing stress may appear frightened or nervous. Um, it may be pacing or running, moving about quickly, or it may develop a vice. So when we talk about vices, that's going to be um, examples such as cribbing or stall weaving. Keep in mind those vices, um, that is a optional topic to present for week 14. Make sure you're getting those topics submitted. Um, just a little reminder there. But when we talk about vices, that is one topic that I gave you the option of presenting on. Um, other things that we consider in recognizing signs of stress in horses is abnormal sweating may be a sign of physical or physiological stress. Muscle tone can provide us some clues. Um, if our horse is tense, sweating, and their muscles are contracted, then they may be tying up. 
um, tied up we'll talk about in detail as we get into these different types of stress later on in this lecture. Um, and if the muscles are flaccid and extremely relaxed, then the horse is going to be depressed and the central nervous system may be damaged. If any of these signs are observed in our horse, a closer inspection is going to be needed so we can determine the root of this stress so that we can address it. Um, and then intervention may be necessary to prevent moving forward. Stress can be grouped into four different categories in our horses. So these four categories of stress include behavioral, mechanical, nutritional or metabolic, and immunological. So I'm going to talk about three of those in a fair amount of detail when we go through that behavioral, nutritional, and metabolic, and immunological. The one that I won't cover in significant detail is mechanical. And that's because mechanical stress, mechanical stress is essentially the structural injury that can be detected by lameness, local inflammation, swelling, heat, and or pain. So we want to make sure that we're checking for injuries as part of our daily routine. So in talking about mechanical stress, we could go in a significant amount of detail um, on lameness, on lameness um, but that's almost a lecture in itself. So I'm going to hold off. Um, hold off on that for this one when we're just doing an introduction of these different four types of stress. <clears throat> so the first type of stress that we want to talk about is behavioral stress. And when we're managing horses in a low stress environment, it requires understanding how their senses perceive the world and a few different principles of their behavior. So in our first week of lab, I did a, a basic overview on horse behavior, on their flight zones, their line of motions, um, binocular and monocular vision. We did a very basic introduction to that. So we'll cover that in a little bit more detail in this lecture. Then we'll move forward into additional sensory perception. So horses aren't going to see the world as humans do. Um, like most prey animals, the horse's eyes are going to be set on the sides of their heads, which allows close to a 350 degree range of monocular vision. Horses are going to be able to use both monocular and binocular vision. Monocular vision allows them to see about 280 degrees around them, whereas binocular vision allows them to focus on objects in front of them. So binocular vision is going to make up about 65 degrees of their range of vision. This is going to provide a horse with the best chance to spot a predator. The horse's wide range of monocular vision has two different blind spots. So these are areas where the animal cannot see. The first is in front of the face. And then the second is right behind its head, which extends over the back and behind the tail when standing with a head facing straight forward. The horse is going to use its binocular vision by looking straight at an object, raising its head when it looks at a distant predator, or focuses on an obstacle to jump. Just as a couple of examples of when our horse is going to use its binocular vision. To use binocular vision on a closer object near the ground, such as a snake or threat to its feet, the horse drops its nose and looks down with its neck somewhat arched. Horses are going to be very sensitive to motion as motion is usually the first alert that a predator is going to be approaching the animal. Um, such motion is usually the first detection um, whereas horses usually have poor visual accuracy and horses will usually act defensively and run if something suddenly moves into their peripheral field of vision. Um, horses, um, in contrast to vision, um, horses are actually going to hear better than people do. So that brings us into our um, next item of sensory perception, which is our horse's ears. So when horses hear much better than people do, um, they use their hearing for three primary functions. They use them to detect sounds, to determine the location of a sound, 
and to provide sensory information that allows the horse to recognize the identity of those different sounds. Um, horses can hear very low to very high frequency sound in the range of 14 hertz to 25 kilohertz. Um, horses ears are going to be able to move about 180 degrees using 10 different muscles and are able to single out a specific area to listen to. This is going to allow the horse to orient itself towards the sounds to be able to determine what is making the noise. A unique anatomical feature allowing horses to focus on the direction from which the sound is coming, isolate it, and then move about in the other direction. Um, another item that I want to hit on with behavioral stress and sensory perception in less detail is going to be the horse's range of smell or their olfactory. is more accurate than that of humans, but less sensitive than that of dogs. Horses use their senses of smell to identify other horses, people, predators, as well as feedstuffs. Horses are also very sensitive to touch as their untrained natural response is to move into pressure. The horse's sense of touch is used as the primary tool of communication between humans and horses, including almost every aspect of the training process. They can feel any movement of the rider and can distinguish a subtle weight shift or a light movement of the reins. So understanding, understanding the sensory perception of the horse, um, how their anatomy is set up, is going to be influential in understanding what common and good management practices are for our equine partners. Another thing to hit on um, during this slide when we're talking about our horses using their ears, um, they do use their ears, like we talked about those three primary functions, primarily as receptors, but also as communicators. Um, so horses are going to communicate with each other through not only their ears, but also other visual signs. Recognizing these signs can help owners to understand their horses, as anger is demonstrated by laying the ears back, pursing the lips, and swishing of the tail. So on the right-hand side, our second horse down, you can see that horse with their ears laid back, their lips pulled back, um, clearly a horse that is upset. Interested horses are going to cock their ears forward and have a relaxed body. So that horse that is alert and friendly, that upper, um, on the right-hand side, our upper horse there. A fearful horse may put, its fears, may put its ears forward or to the side. Um, its body is going to be tense and its tail clamped or stiff. A relaxed horse has ears that are relaxed and may have one hind leg cocked. And they may also be chewing or licking at their lips. These behaviors can be easily recognized and may alert the owner to certain stereotypes of horse behavior. Um, such examples include some horses are sullen and difficult most of the time, while others are actually treacherous. Bad-tempered and resentful horses may bite, strike, or kick at any time. So in saying that is that um, some of our horses are going to have different personalities per se, and um, some of their communication styles may be different. So it's important to know um, what is normal for your horse. Um, our next item that we want to be aware of is our horse's social behaviors. A social behavior of the horse is going to be controlled by the herd instinct and dependent on the horse's natural instinct genetic makeup, and also their experiences throughout life. Horses are going to seek out and enjoy the companionship of other horses, so like we talked about, as they are herd animals. Social order is going to be important, and there is an established dominance hierarchy in any herd of horses. Dominance is the ability to control access to resources. The dominance hierarchy requires that each horse recognizes other horses and determine through some initial um, 
and this is determined through some initial aggressive acts, such as biting or kicking, and others with submissive acts, such as running away. Which horse is dominant and which horse is subordinate? After the initial conflicts establish the hierarchy, just the signs of anger from the dominant animal will be enough to warn the subordinates. Pecking order can change if a horse is removed from a group for several weeks or if the mare is an estrus or is going to have a foal in the short term. Initial contact across, soft, across safe fences can alleviate some social stresses and introduce horses gradually can help avoid injuries associated with biting. <clears throat> it can also be helpful to provide extra feed stations and divide the feed so horses all get adequate portions is another way that we can avoid conflict um, when we consider social behavior and the addition or reduction of horses into a herd and establishing our pecking order. So now that we have finished up our behavioral stress, um, our second sign of recognizing stress or our second group of stresses in horses is going to be mechanical. So like I said, I'm not going to talk about that in a large amount of detail for this lecture as these mechanical stresses are going to be related to structural injuries which can be detected by lameness, local inflammation, swelling, heat, and or pain. So the next one that we're going to talk about is going to be nutritional and metabolic stress. A lot of this information we covered in detail when we went through our equine nutrition unit in a prior week. Um, but for a quick review, a horse's digestive system is designed to handle frequent small meals. They are going to be continuous grazers by nature and usually do best when kept at pasture. If this is not possible, good quality hay fed in frequent meals is the next best thing. Nutritional programs are going to be designed by evaluating each horse's weight and condition, and horses must be fed individually in most cases. Energy requirements of easy keepers and hard keepers can differ by up to 30%, and about 80% of a horse's feed is going to go towards meeting its energy requirements. The hay used should contain the most nutrients per dollar. To reduce stress, horses require that a certain portion of that diet be made up of a roughage. Vitamins and mineral requirements must also be met by not exceeding, but not exceeding for the stage and condition of the horse. There are going to be three metabolic problems in horses that are closely associated with nutrition. These include colic, laminitis, and tying up. Horse owners need to learn to recognize these conditions as they can be serious health problems for horses. Um, once more, I'm not going to cover that in a large amount of detail for this lecture, but we will moving forward in later lectures this week and semester. Next, we want to talk about our immunological stress. In talking about this type of stress, we are going to go over vaccination programs and deworming. It was very evident in completing your lab assignment this week, which we didn't meet in person, but you had an online lab assignment. Um, it was evident that lectures weren't watched in their entirety and a true understanding wasn't developed. Um, yes, these lectures were very scientific, but I don't doubt that it wasn't information that could be understood by students in this Introduction to Horse Science class. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a complete rundown of the vaccination program and deworming program, kind of an example of notes that should have been taken from the lectures you had last week. And that way I know that content is covered, if there's any misunderstandings, if content was covered in too much depth, um, there's no excuses for not knowing this information. So I'm going to cover it in a, maybe a Cliff Notes version per se in these next two slides. So stress caused by disease and or parasites can range from superficial discomfort to death. 
And a good vaccination program is going to be our best defense against infectious diseases. Um, so first thing I want to hit on is why do we vaccinate? Why do we use a vaccination program? In order to determine which vaccination should be administered to our horses, we must first determine the risk of disease, consequences of disease, effectiveness of the vaccine, adverse reactions, as well as the cost of immunization versus the cost of the disease. So in that last portion there, we talk about the cost of immunization. How much does our vaccination cost versus how much are we going to spend in treating our horse if they are to contract that disease? Another consideration to keep in mind is that protection is not equal among individual horses and in various situations. Protection is not immediate and it's going to take a amount of time before that vaccination is going to be effective after we give it. Control and prevention are going to be key. However, vaccinations are only one consideration and other precautions should also be taken in preventing this immunological stress. Next, how does a vaccination work? Most of you got this right on the assignment last week, so I'm not extremely concerned on, on your understanding here. But in talking about how a vaccination works, when we give a horse an injection, an antigen is going to be introduced into the body. The body is then going to respond by producing antibodies to protect the horse from the antigen, which was introduced by the vaccine. When the horse is naturally exposed to the virus, the body has the antibodies to fight the disease. Next, what factors are going to affect a vaccine? Various levels of exposures, such as traveling to shows, boarding facilities, and traveling across state lines. This is going to play hand in hand with an increased equine population density which increases exposure and risk. Movement of horses on and off facilities should be considered as it increases risk of exposure to horses in both facilities. Resistance should be considered in vaccination use, but is a greater issue in considering deworming. Environmental and managerial influences are going to be great preventative measures, although oftentimes these items are overlooked. So examples are going to include having a manure management plan in place and a reduction of standing water on site. Management, um, managing each of these examples removes or at least reduces the breeding ground for mosquitoes and other unwanted parasites. When considering the condition of each horse, stress, parasites, nutrition, and sanitation are factors which are going to increase our horse's risk of contracting one of these diseases. When talking about our core vaccinations, these are our vaccinations we want to give to most horses, we have Eastern and Western encephalitis, tetanus, West Nile virus, and rabies. Each of these diseases was covered in a fair amount of detail in lecture last week. If you feel like you need a review of how these diseases are contracted, symptoms of the horse, and how often they should be vaccinated for, feel free to review that lecture from last week. Um, as for risk-based vaccination, so our core vaccinations is the minimum of what all horses should receive. For our core-based vaccinations, Examples include rhinopneumonitis, equine influenza, botulism, and strangles. Um, aside from our core vaccines, these risk-based vaccines should be given on a case-by-case -case basis. Factors that will largely determine which risk-based vaccinations are needed for a horse include the geographical location, management practices, age, the amount of travel, and the horse's use or purpose. When considering various vaccinations, it should be noted a separate injection is not required for each individual vaccination, but rather there are various options available where a single injection protects against multiple diseases. Collaboration with your veterinarian is always recommended to determine the best approach for you 
and your equine partner. So when we're talking about these risk-based vaccinations, I mentioned rhinopneumonitis and equine influ influenza. These two vaccinations are recommended for horses that are frequently traveling to horse shows. Another one that I mentioned is botulism. So botulism is going to be recommended for horses that are consuming hay from the ground or from round bells while outdoors, not housed indoors. So they're going to have extended exposure to wildlife. Um, Strangles is a vaccine that a lot of boarding facilities are still requiring, but there is a fair amount of discussion behind the effectiveness and how, um, how necessary a Strangles vaccine is for our horses. So that should give you a quick overview of our vaccination programs and what we're looking for specifically. This is also a topic that was discussed in great detail in last week's lecture, a fair amount of scientific information. Um, but since we're talking about immunological stress, um, deworming programs are also going to come into play moving beyond our vaccinations. So an effective deworming program must be included good for good management practices as well as regular, regular use of antiparasitic drugs. So in talking about this again, the goal of parasite control programs is to minimize the risk of parasitic disease, control parasite egg shedding, and maintain efficacy of drugs. As a result of traditional parasite control programs, which involve the rotational treatment with amphimetics at regular intervals, resistance has developed. Amphimetics are medications which, excel, which expel parasitic worms, especially of the intestine. As a result of this development of amphimetic resistance, it is important current parasite control programs prevent this and in turn maintain the efficacy of drugs for future generations of horse owners. So when we're looking at our fecal egg count, in order to accomplish the goals of our parasite control program, a fecal egg count should be performed to determine the amount of egg shedding of an individual horse. So we talked about um, in lab last week, we went over how to perform a fecal egg count, or two weeks ago, we performed a fecal egg count. And then in lecture last week, we went over, <coughs> or Holly went over, um, different types of parasites, different types of dewormers, and then she covered in detail how to perform a fecal egg count. So I'm not really sure where the disconnect happened here, but for those of you that need a review, um, a fecal egg count is going to be simplistic to complete. However, it is going to require the use of a microscope. Limitations of equipment requires fecal egg counts to commonly be performed at a veterinarian's office. When collecting a fecal sample, it should be fresh, stored in an airtight leak-proof container or plastic bag, and then refrigerated. Samples should be tested within seven days of collection, and then in interpreting the results of a fecal egg count, one to 200 eggs per gram is considered a low shedder, 200 to 500 eggs per gram is considered a moderate shedder, and greater than 500 eggs per gram is considered a high shedder. So I think I misspoke there. 1 to 200 eggs per gram is going to be a low shedder. 2 to 500 is moderate. Greater than 500 is a high shedder. So make sure you have those different ranges written down correctly. Uh, most horses will have a parasite load since they are part of nature. However, the key is to minimize and prevent clinical signs by maintaining equilibrium within the animal. So then we want to look at environmental and management practices because, yes, um, doing our fecal egg count, knowing when we need to use a dewormer and an inflammatic, inflammatic drug is going to be important, but ultimately we need to evaluate environmental and management practices um, as these are going to come into play on our parasite load in our horses. These various influences will have a significant impact on the parasite loads of equine managed at a facility. Adequate grazing is going to be important to maintain pastures which are not too tall or too short. A pasture that is less than 3 inches 
is going to result in the horse ingesting all larvae and egg stages that are present. However, horses with limited access to pasture or on dry lots with the absence of grass often have lower fecal egg counts. Stocking density should be considered as overstocking results in a high level of parasite exposure. Horses that are pasture mates will commonly share the same population of parasites as well as resistance. Animal interactions such as exposure to wildlife, new stock, or visitors should also be considered. New stock should be quarantined, especially if history of deworming vaccinations and coggins is unknown on the new animal. Visitors can also include human visitors who have horses of their own, as this can result in the tracking of feces in on their boots, just to explain one example of why we want to consider human visitors and their interaction with our horses. In addition, equipment can transport unwanted parasites, reiterating the importance of manure management as well as fly control. That brings us into our different type of anthelmintic formulations. So there are a various amount of treatment options available and a couple of anthelmintic formulations will be discussed. Fembidazole is going to interfere with the worm's energy metabolism on a cellular level. Pyrental panelate is going to act at the neuromuscular junction, causing an irreversible rigid paralysis. Prozequantil is going to be the only dewormer that is effective against tapeworms. In the United States, Prozequantil is only available in combination with ivermectin or moxidectin. Parasite control program goals can be achieved with one to two treatments of dewormer each year in most cases. Treatments should be focused on seasons of peak transmission, including fall and spring, and a spring deworming with a fimbendazole or prosequinate and a fall treatment of ivermectin with prosequantil is sufficient in most horses. All additional treatments should be targeting horses that are high shedders, so those with high fecal egg counts, and those which display clinical signs of parasite infestation. It should also be noted that when we're determining the dosage of a dewormer that is required for an individual horse, it is going to be determined by that horse's weight. So if livestock sales are not available, then we can use our weight tape or our weight equation, again, that we talked about in previous week's lectures, to determine our horse's weight so that we can make sure that we are determining the dosage of dewormer correctly. It is important not to underdose our horses. It is also important when we're considering deworming that we are always cautious and also consult our veterinarian um, for advice in our area and making sure that we are rotating our anthelmintic um, drugs as we should be. So at this point, you should have a very solid review of vaccination programs and deworming programs. When I went through your labs for last week, I graded those very, very generously. Um, it was evident that there wasn't a significant amount of understanding on these two topics as there should have been because lectures last week covered those in great, great detail. So make sure um, if you didn't understand those for whatever reason, um, make sure that you are taking notes in these last two slides when I heavily reviewed it. Because I've gone back and I've done a review, I did a review um, because it was clear that it wasn't understood the first time. So I did this review, but in saying that, because I've done this review, because I broke it down and I pulled out those important parts, this is likely going to be very heavily tested on your exam. Make sure you're prepared. Make sure you know the information. With this being said, this will complete your week 11A lecture, and you are now free to complete your assignment for 11A.